Welcome to the podcast is dedicated to making you a faster cyclist to ask a cycling coach podcast presented by trainer road. I'm coach Jonathan Lee. And we just have the, geez, I think this is the, actually the OG OG crew. We just it's have, not. it's not, you Who's and the Chad OG were the OG. OG. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I just, joined up for like four episodes. That's actually a good point. Yeah. Good point. Chad, you and I OG for the Do you want me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that our listeners would revolt if you left, they like you. So, uh, okay. We have our head coach, Chad Timmerman, and our CEO, Nate Pearson. How's it going, y'all? Good. It's going well. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I introduced you guys differently than normal. Uh, okay, well, let's get into it, because today we have, Chad, is it fair to say, like, a ton of sh- uh, medium dives, sh- medium dives, not really deep have, dives today? We have a few, but I'm going to be honest, I'm going I'm to wing the other two, because I, I didn't notice until the last minute that Amber wasn't a contributor, so I kind of hope that she, <laughs> she would weigh in on some of this, so I'm looking at you, you two. Okay, here we go. We got this, Nate. Put the team on our back. Um, <laughs> oh, God. We don't need science. We just need blather and banter. That's it. That's it. Okay. Well, then, let's just get straight into it. If you're listening on uh, on any sort of podcast app, share and rate the podcast. Huge help. If you're on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. If you're in the live chat, we may have some time for live questions. Apparently now that uh, it's up to Nate and I to carry things uh, when it gets to some complicated questions. So we'll see how we do. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Let's go first into Gabby's question. Gabby says, hey team, long time listener and, and budding pro triathlete here. Way to go, Gabby. Uh, trainer road is a vital part of my training program and has helped me increase my five minute power immensely as my drowning abilities for everyone else is swimming. Uh, it's super relatable for me has me needing to bridge really hard at the start of the bike to get back to the front of the pack. My question has to do with Epsom salt baths and if there are any proven science to the supposed recovery benefit it gives. Additionally, is it true that DOMS from strength sessions can be reduced if you stretch statically immediately after the session? As a triathlete, I can't avoid doing strength sessions the day before a key session for at least one discipline. So reducing DOMS as much as possible is one of my focuses. Thank you so much for your podcast. Uh, Thursdays are now my favorite days. And then also says, P.S. Chad, I'm a sports science geek, so the dive can never be too deep. All right, Chad, where it do you can, want to start it, with this one? It can go too deep for sure. It, <laughs> sadly, it can. We've, yes. we've plumbed those depths. It can, in fact, go too deep. Um, so where do you want to start? Well, she, she has a couple questions here, and I'm going to address one very succinctly and just say hard, hard no. Uh, the whole idea that DOMS can be reduced from strength session, sessions via static stretching, uh, stretching in any re- respect, really, if, if the damage is done, stretching, isn't going to reverse it. There is a healing process. If it's an unfamiliar movement or type of stress that you're inflicting on the muscles, there's just a recovery path and no, no, no research that we've gone over. And we've covered this in depth at different times, uh, supports the idea that stretching can weave you or work you out of that situation, dig you out of that hole any quicker than, than just allowing it to heal. So. Uh, instead, let's let's look at reducing you know muscle soreness and facilitating recovery via the use of Epsom salts, which unfortunately is no more encouraging. Oh, and I'm man. just gonna cut to the chase and tell you, you know, right from the start, just no. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to string you along. Just no. <laughs> Next, Next question. question. <laughs> yeah. But no. But um, seriously, let me talk about some minor and still important points. First off, there aren't really any downsides. Nothing I came across says that doing this and doing it frequently leads to anything negative. And then, secondly, never underestimate the value of the placebo effect. It's real. If this is something that that brings you relief in any manner and makes you feel like you're recovering faster or just feel better in general, whether it's physiological or psychological, go with it. And then thirdly, it is downtime. It, it's still relaxation and, and it's usually done in, in warm water. You know, too many people who take ice baths with Epsom salts in it. And in fact, the salt wouldn't dissolve. So it wouldn't work anyway. So this is assumed that it's a, it's a warm experience, which, you know, warm water will in, improve circulation, uh, can facilitate lymph drainage, certain things that, that we seek anyway, but the same can be said of numerous recovery modalities. So does magnesium sulfate stand out in any uh, recovery specific ways? And, and there's not a lot of research on magnesium sulfate, but before we go jumping to the old axiom of absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. There is in fact, research on subdermal absorption. So regardless mm-hmm. of what we're talking about rubbing on the skin, there's plenty of research that tells us whether or not that holds any validity. So, uh, actually first let's talk about or differentiate between magnesium sulfate and magnesium. 
So magnesium sulfate is the form of magnesium that comes in a topical or that is used for topical use. So with, with Epsom salts, with any other topical application of magnesium is going to be magnesium sulfate, but really we're talking about magnesium. So let's look at the benefits of magnesium supplementation and the potential harmful effects of magnesium deficiency. Before we get into that, Chad, but we're both going to probably do the same thing. Yeah, go like, ahead. So what this is, is you get in a bath and you get a big thing, a bag of Epsom salt and you scoop stuff into the bathtub and you mix it up. And supposedly when you get in the bath, then uh, magnesium will be uh, brought in from the water into your muscles and then you'll feel better. Uh, you'll like recover faster, feel amazing. That's I've done this because I was, so I. there's many, uh, many uh, people on the internet were like that, or they <laughs> sell like, um, magnesium spray on your skin, right? And that's supposed to make you uh, feel better and stuff. So this next part, I'm very interested in. Uh, mm-hmm. But Jonathan, well, you're going to cover the same thing or something else? You, you nailed it, Nate. Exactly. Okay. We were on the same track. Yep. Like, yeah. Like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Should I put it on my food? Um, <laughs> no, no. It's the whole what do I eat in a bathtub? Yeah. <laughs> it's like cereal. Just mix it in with the bowl. <laughs> Sorry, Chad. Go ahead. No, that's fine. That, that, I, I should have mentioned that. So thank you for intervening. So, uh, I'll, I'll keep the, the, the scientific or the, often, the too often. <laughs> super details, very narrow and talk about, uh, the fact that magnesium is a cofactor for 300 plus enzymatic enzymatic reactions. So it's, it's involved in a lot of physiological processes. I'll keep it relevant to the ones that affect us as endurance athletes, ATP metabolism, protein synthesis regulation of muscle control, blood pressure, cardiac excitability. So our heart vasomotor tone, and that's basically the the ability to relax and contract our our blood vessels are not really the ability, but the goings on, uh, neuromuscular conduction. So the communication between, you know, brain and nerves through two muscles and insulin metabolism, it does play a part in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mellitus, which, you know, is type two diabetes and seizures. So there are implications and interactions that are hundred percent legit. And, and these are high, highly scientifically supported to the point where one study labeled them beyond controversy. It's just accepted. Nobody argues this. It's real. One example in particular was a study uh, from a meta from 2016 that demonstrated a clear beneficial impact on blood pressure of, of, of amongst the things that I just named. So again, magnesium is in fact vital to biological function. And this is, this is relevant to both humans, but it's also potentially performance impacting w- with athletes and more to Gabby's question, a pronounced deficiency is linked to such things as muscle cramps, you know, increased neuromuscular excitability. The two go hand in hand. And I saw a couple mentions of particular camping in the uh, cramping, sorry, in the calves and in the soles of the feet, which, you know, resonated with me. And I, and I know magnesium isn't target specific. It's not going to go specifically to those muscles and solve your cramp issues there. But if there is any impact on cramps, great. I mean, it does make me think when I am cramping, is there a possibility that my magnesium levels are uh, lower than usual? Almost. So that's an interesting point. So in the study, they were talking about calf and foot and foot cramps, right? Chad, is that what yeah. you just said? Mm-hmm. So th- this is the sort of thing that always makes me question uh, the, or like not want to jump to conclusions. It doesn't necessarily, you aren't implying, or the research, did it imply that it would help specifically with calf and foot cramps? No, it just mentioned those other cramps specifically. And the athletes that they looked at suffered those specifically, or maybe more prevalently. Yeah. Cause those are like, that's a really common cramping spot for just uh, people. Consider what we're doing. Right. Yeah. People in general. And then people who are on bikes, even if, even though we have hard sole shoes, we're still putting a lot of stress through the feet to the pedals runners, obviously hikers, uh, skiers, et cetera. Got it. Feet cool. play a just, pretty integral role in most things we do. Just wanted to cover that because, uh, I don't want people thinking that for some reason it's effective at helping a certain type of cramp in your body, but not another. Sure. Uh, another, <clears throat> another thing to mention on this is that I think I'll say this. I believe, I think lots of other people believe that cramping is multifaceted. It's mm-hmm. not just only like a magnesium deficiency, but sometimes they'll, you know, you'll see certain products on more magnesium than other. Um, and the type of magnesium you take too, if you supplement it, uh, I forget the kind, there's the a lower quality kind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it, it gives you diarrhea. <laughs> like it is, yeah. it is, it is a cleansing uh, thing. So just, I just want to mention that because if somebody is new to the podcast and I'll be like, Oh, I just take magnesium all the time, <laughs> um, to cure all my cramps. 
it might help, but uh, it could be something else. Mm -hmm. It is pretty widely accepted. It's not argued really anywhere anymore that, that cramps are multifaceted. There's no one thing we can figure out otherwise, and then we'd have done it a while ago. Throw back to Chad and hot shots at Levi's grand fund. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. I mean, we, we tried so many things and, and, and nutritional components may be an aspect of it, but they're not the only yeah. aspect. So the, the point of everything stated so far is that there's clear muscle related implications with, with respect to magnesium. And then also magnesium deficiency is associated with both hypokalemia and hypocalcemia. So we're talking about low levels in the blood of potassium and uh, calcium respectively. And this just further drives home the ties to muscle function. But the real question here, Gabby's question is it is, can topical magnesium bring us magnesium's benefits? Can we, can we actually supplement magnesium topically? So this question led me to uh, the study that I basically leaned on. And fortunately it was a review. So it steered me toward many other studies that I'll touch on briefly, but it's uh, Grover, Vorman and Kister's 2017, pretty recent literature review, and it was in the nutritional journal nutrients. And what they looked at is, or what they asked, the question is transdermal magnesium sulfate myth or reality, because the claim, and Nate already alluded to this is that transdermal absorption. So, you know, absorption across the skin is superior to, to oral ingestion. And, and the reasons that are often touted by, uh, the, the less than reputable blogosphere, the, the pseudoscientists, you know, the people who you, you are right to question say that it bypasses the GI tract. And, and because of that, and, and that much makes sense, but because of that, there's superior absorption all the way up to potentially hundred percent absorption, which in that way, there should be a big, big red flag. <laughs> and, and maybe it's tied to, because of this GI bypass, but there are fewer side effects. So these are the two claims that, that are always driven home. And, and I want to cough and use a particular word, but I'm just going to call it nonsense. All this is, is just savvy exploitative marketing. We've seen it too many times to, to not recognize it for what it is. Now, Grober and colleagues clarify that they, they clarify where these transdermal so-called benefits actually break down. And they, early on in the, the uh, literature review, they use a line that is absolutely one of the, my favorite that I've ever read in a scientific paper. It says, skepticism based on ignorance impairs scientific evaluation as much as claims based on excessive faith. Wow. So being uninformed or, you know, basically neglecting to inform yourself is as bad as being overzealous. Huh. And it's definitely, definitely stands to reason or stands holds true here, at least with regards to, you know, being scientifically objective. So let's, let's look at the skin. I mean, the skin is a barrier. Say it with me. It, the skin's job is to protect us from intrusions. And, and they point out some of those intrusions, ultraviolet radiation, chemicals, allergens, microorganisms, also helps us keep things in, right? It prevents loss of moisture, helps us retain body nutrients. But with regards to the skin as a barrier, think about sunscreens and lotions and shampoos and soaps, bug sprays, Embro for the, for the cycling bros who for some reason slather that on their skin, sodium bicarbonate. My legs look good, Chad. And, and yeah, no, no sir. Sodium bicarbonate. And as much as I'd like to say, there's, there's a lot of research to support the absorption of sodium bicarbonate through the skin. There just isn't and other random topical magical bullets by this logic, really anything that you rub on your skin would end up in your bloodstream. And to further that logic uh, up to a hundred percent will end up in your bloodstream. So to continue with this logic, we shouldn't really need to ingest anything, right? We just put a proper ratio of glucose to fructose in our sunscreen and say goodbye to GI stress on race day. You know, we, we, we don't even need to eat anything getting it all via the skin, but jokes aside, and, and to frame this another way, there's really just two routes of, uh, someone's going to cut you out bodily and attack video. He's just going to be like <laughs> proper glucose fructose video. Get you out of context. Yeah. The sound bites like, are a little how bad. We are. Sound know, bites right? are a little dangerous. Yeah. Okay. But two, two ways things can get into the body, um, through the skin or into the body in general. One is the gastrointestinal epithelium, and this is actually designed for absorption and then the dermal epithelium. So our skin, and this is designed to serve as a barrier, just as I said. So let's look at really the, the only two ways for chemicals to gain entry via our skin. And, and the first is to penetrate the epidermis and to do so, whatever we're rubbing on there would have to penetrate the outermost layer, which is called the stratum corneum. And this is comprised of about 15 to 20 layers of flattened dead skin cells loaded with keratin and keratin is a highly fibrous protein. 
And these cells, these stratum corneum cells are actually embedded in a lipid or a fat matrix, which means they're water repellent. Okay. So access only via lipophilic substances, fat friendly substances, magnesium sulfate, is neither wa water soluble nor fat soluble. Combine it with oxygen and it becomes water soluble, still not fat soluble. Also, magnesium ions are way too big to penetrate biological membranes. Called that directly from Grover's review. And I, and I should also mention that these are dead layers of skin we're talking about. They're not exactly brimming with magnesium transporters, you know, nor nuclei, nor organelles. They're dead. That's, that's it. They're, they're, not, they're not concerned with doing anything. So alternatively, chemical entry may be possible through, and, and this is, this is maybe where this, maybe where people glom onto this is absorption by sweat glands, which, you know, further fuels the, the fear of aluminum and antiperspirant more on that or absorption via hair follicles, which, you know, yay, Alpacin, yay, caffeinated shampoo. And, and I know we'll get in trouble, but just saying the word Alpacin, I have to uh -oh. point out, I have to point <laughs> out how proud I am. <laughs> of my, my boys, they, so, so we had, uh, made some notes here, four days of Dunkirk, which is actually a six day race these days, whatever Gianni Vermeesh and Lionel Tamino both scored stage wins almost simultaneously. Sam Gaze is over in Alpstadt, Germany, winning the short track event. And then Matthew Vanderpool is cleaning house at the Giro somehow. I mean, you steer yeah. this fella at anything and he, he goes to the tour one time, takes home a couple of yellow jerseys. Goes to the Giro one time, takes home a couple of pink jerseys. It's it's unreal. So I, maybe it's maybe it's the shampoo. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so yes, there are two potential chemical inroads via our skin, but and perhaps why aluminum may not be the big threat that popular research literature makes it out to be is that hair follicles plus sweat glands comprise roughly 0.1 to 1% of our skin surface, which to me says we're going to need a lot of salts absorbed in very key locations in order to amount to any real relevant effect. So my takeaway, Gabby, is that this is not only highly unlikely, it's verging on impossible. And the remainder of Grober's review either debunks or cast doubts on the minimal but existing literature on the dermal absorption of magnesium specifically. And it does it pretty interestingly. So for the geeks, for the Gabbies out there, it is a study I recommend. It's a quick read too. Nice. Awesome. Thanks, Chad. Uh, no longer do I need to dump salt into the bath, but it does smell good because sometimes they make it smell good. I don't know mm. if it's recuperative at all. You know, it's relaxing. Like lavender. <laughs> lavender, exactly. Nate knows mm -hmm. what's up. Uh, okay, you know. Adam, let's go into Adam's question. He says, or actually, Nate, do you have anything to add to this or no? Right into Adams? No. Mm -hmm. Cool. He says, hi, I'll love the podcast. And he says, love the product and the podcast. In a mere six months, I've seen my FCP go from 299 to 340 by using Trainer Road, a real testament to the great workouts and training plans you've created. So thank you. That's awesome. That's crazy. That's a big increase. That's a big increase. Like, it, I mean, uh, depending on, so let's just assume it's a flat course. If you can get to, this is not his question. I'm just talking about his, the big FTP that we're dealing with here. But if you have a 340 watt FTP, that makes you pretty darn like resilient in a lot of conditions that would make other people flounder. Right. So crosswinds, headwinds, high yeah. speed sections, uh, rough road surfaces or gravel. If you have a 340 FTP, that makes it so that you can ride at sweet spot when other people are riding at threshold. Yeah, that's you know? a lot of power to play with, even for big riders. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so now my question. Last night, I went to the local race ride and through a ton of pain and effort, was able to hold on and finish with the pack for the first time. The difficult part was the anaerobic type efforts, sprinting out of a turn, catching back onto the group, et cetera, followed by what felt like minutes at VO2. So my question is what type of workouts I can do to get my body used to those high intensity anaerobic efforts followed immediately by VO2 or upper threshold with no rest in between. I feel like most workouts I've done have the effort, then a rest period, which doesn't exactly line up with my experience during the race ride. Any, so any suggestions would be helpful. Thanks again for what you're doing. Nate, I want you to kick us off on this one. And then yeah. Chad, I kind of want to talk about like what goes on in our bodies with this as well. Okay. I'm going to assume Adam is a larger rider. Uh, like myself. And the things that I hear in this are uh, sprinting out of corners, catching up back to the group. To me, I'm, I'm this guy too. You're bad at quartering Adam. This is the, that's the real problem here is especially with the 340 FTP at a local group ride. I don't know who's riding this ride, but at 340, um, 
you know, the, the 340 should be able to stay on, but the, the words that I'm hearing is catching back up because if you're going into a turn and everyone else is gapping you, then obviously you're the one that is, uh, not turning correctly. And maybe John, you can help us with some, uh, turning stuff. And actually the, some of the ones that Pete said that was really nice and helped me is when going into a corner, I gap the person a teeny bit, and then I do one extra pedal stroke. And Meaning that you corner, let the person in front of you open up a little bit. Is that what you mean? Yeah, by just like a wheel. Yeah, yeah, like a wheel. You let them get ahead half. a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever. So I'm in the draft. I'm really close. And then I just, I make that distance larger because I want to maintain more speed. So maybe they're slowing down in the corner, but I am going to have one more pedal stroke. And as we're going through the corner, I'm actually coming up on them. And what really sucks is if they slow down a ton and you do this wrong and you're going too fast. So if it's too big of a gap, you can have to hit the brakes in the corner, which is very, very bad. But in general, that will make it so that on the exit, you don't have to uh, sprint up as much if someone in front of you slows down more, because that's the worst part, right? Someone uh, in front of you slows down and then you have to slow down. And John will like, John gets upset. John, you get upset when someone <laughs> corners oh, yeah. poorly in front of you in a race and makes you have to sprint out. Yeah. Well, I, I used to, I think I used to get more upset. Now I just uh, instantly think, okay, I need to get past this person or I need to find a different strategy because some of it might not be. Uh, in this case, maybe Adam's a great corner, but bad at positioning. And really those two are inherently tied together too. But if you're bad at positioning and you're putting yourself in a spot so that every time you go through this turn, you're cutting it really tight on the inside. As a result, maybe you have to tap your brakes while other people don't have to tap their brakes. Or you're always taking the sort of line that puts you on the wind side instead of the lee side. Uh, then you'll find yourself in a situation where you're always having to work harder. So like Nate said, the there's- side? Yeah. Yeah. So What's like the lee uh, side? uh, leeward, windward like and leeward. Uh, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. That. my last name. Yeah. So <laughs> opposite of wind. Um, so in, and this is like Nate said, a super key thing is to recognize where you're losing that, that speed and where you're having to reaccelerate. And don't think of the moment when you're accelerating, think of the things that led up to that. That's really what Nate's getting at, which is such an important thing to think of as a, as a bike rider. Don't think of the moment that it hurts. Just like we always talk about, everyone says, oh, I'm just a bad climber. Well, think about everything you did leading up to that climb. Were you as efficient as you should have been? And think about the turns the same way. When you're coming into that turn, were you riding so close that anything anybody did in front of you, you had to do plus some sort of exponential magnification because you're so close? Or did you have enough padding so that you could accelerate into them smoothly with momentum instead of using a ton of watts and being able to carry that momentum? But positioning is just it goes hand in hand with, with Nate's point. Uh, Nate, did you want to add something? Yeah. Adam, the other thing is the, the best. I love being the first person into a corner because when you do this, uh, there's multiple times. If you take the corner poorly and you slow down, there's going to be this accordion factor behind you. Cause everyone else is going to do all these gaps and they are going to have to catch back up. And I'm not saying do this on purpose, but if you don't take it as fast as someone else might do, because they might do the same strategy that I talked about, if you take it really well, well, you're going to gap people too, because other people will touch the brakes. Um, and the, the extra energy that it will take to get to the front or be near the front into a corner is probably less than that acceleration that happens when you're at the back and there's a huge accordion and you have to do a, you know, an 800 watt sprint for two seconds or three seconds, that stuff burns you out so quickly. Uh, it's, it's really, really hard. And for the anaerobic side, Adam, you know, the, uh, anaerobic workouts. I would do those, the, mm -hmm. especially like the short shorts and stuff like that. Cause I don't think you're going to do short shorts meeting. Like as a little bit on a little bit off, like 50 seconds on 50 seconds off and it repeats. And there'll be sets of those that repeat a lot. Those are really key for crits like this. And if you're doing like a 180 course, um, we have a 180 turn, you're going to sprint out no matter what. And I've always had real problems with that because as a bigger rider, you just have to put out more energy to catch back up. And I'm not as good as doing at 180 turns as other people. Um, if you want to do a plan, I would do the, uh, the crit plan that has those peppered in like your, your group ride sounds like a crit and it probably is just like a crit. I would do that specialty plan, uh, for what is it? Uh, eight weeks and see what happens. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say for now. Bad. And lots of, lots of points there. Uh, so first off you're asking almost what you could do in terms of training or how you can affect your physiology so that you can handle this stuff. And it does sound more like a tactical error than anything. And my inclination is if you're getting tailed off and you have to scramble back on, 
then it's just that you're taking the turns poorly, not that you're positioned poorly, but being positioned poorly can mean that you have to do exactly that because you're taking the turn really well and someone inside in front of you slows. And now you're on the brakes a little bit because they slowed and now you have to scramble back on. So maybe you turn well, but again, you're positioned poorly. So those are the first two things I would look at. And then secondly, when you work your way through the progression of base build specialty, by the time you get to specialty, not real keen on recovery at that point, I expect athletes to be ready to be fully prepared to face what they're going to face during a race ride or an actual race where recovery comes when it comes. And sometimes it doesn't come at all. And you have to figure that out. So efforts are stacked and stacked and stacked. And by then you should have the, the physiology. You mean recovery in a race, not in a training plan. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yep. Cool. Yep. Yeah. But the workouts will emulate what you're facing. So if you haven't progressed through to the specialty plan yet, by the time you do, you're going to start to see workouts that don't give you a heck of a lot of recovery in between hard efforts, much like you're going to face when you get out there and, and all things as they should be, your physiology will be in place to do exactly that. You'll have the big aerobic capacity so that when you delve into the anaerobic supply, you come back from it more quickly because your aerobic system supports it as well as it does. Um, and then I had a couple other points, but they've slipped my mind for the moment. I want to jump into something that you mentioned here. So talking about what actually goes on. Yeah. When you're having to accelerate and attach on, and then it's really the gas is on after that effort that you've done after that initial acceleration, those are largely aerobic efforts. And what Nate's talking about on these anaerobic workouts and Chad as well, those anaerobic workouts really, once again, this goes back to the discussion we had a handful of weeks ago when we talked about anaerobic versus aerobic, they become increasingly more aerobic as you go, right? So if you're building aerobic fitness, that's going to support those sort of efforts. So first of all, that's a big thing. Take that off your chest and, and, and don't feel like you have to do exactly what these efforts are in training in order to be better at them. The other thing that the, let's say that you've, you've, you've nailed it and you're following wheels appropriately. You're taking good lines, you're carrying momentum and you're not losing it in turns. You're doing all these things and it's still accelerating a ton. Knowing that you have an FTP of 340, you have more power than the vast majority of people that you are riding with. Not all, but you have, maybe all, but you have more power than most people that you're riding with. And in that case, I really do think that there's a big component of those sort of efforts that's mental. Nate, i I know that you've like seen this as well in Chad and racing when you, you have an effort that, that's like wide open. And then after that, it stays on in your mind, you build up this story that like, I can't hold this for the rest of the ride. <clears throat> no one's asking you to hold it for the rest of the ride. And you don't have to worry about that. And that's going to stop soon. That's right, one Chad? of the points that I wanted to make. He, he talks about through a ton of pain and effort pains in the brain effort to, to an extent is to, uh, four letters come to mind and, and I know it's crass. I know it's macho, but the, the oh. whole HCFU idea, <laughs> this is what we're talking about right here. Just decide. It's scared Do every it. time. <laughs> yeah. it's Thanks like, for premise. It's going to be bad. And when Chad says it, I'm like, Oh, it really is bad. <laughs> if we can graph so my blood pressure so far in this episode, I've had quite a few spikes, <laughs> but that, that clever little term encapsulates everything that you just Chad, described you have beers here around? and everything that we <laughs> are, are acknowledging is necessary to be able to handle stacked efforts like this. You have yeah. to be tough. Everybody after, after they dole out a hard effort, doesn't matter what level you ride at world-class riders hurt, but they, they compartmentalize it. They, they table it for the moment and they get through the next effort and they, they find ways to mentally reason through the pain to justify the effort and to do it again and again and again. So there is a huge mental component to this. And I think you maybe recognize that when you, whether consciously or subconsciously decided to, to just weather the storm this time you pushed yourself through the pain, you managed the efforts and you hung in there. You made it happen. Adam too, when you're racing there's, so there's different scenarios coming out of a corner. One is like a short climb or something like that. And everyone's pretty much equal. If there's a crosswind. People are pretty much equal. If there's a draft, obviously if you're drafting, you, you put out less power, but think of like train or own, there's those hard start workouts that start with a hard VO or hard anaerobic, and then they stay VO2 max for a couple of minutes. You can find those and feel what, uh, just go in the anaerobic library and click on the hard starts, but you can go in there and feel, see what it feels like. But also if you reduce that anaerobic spike by just a little bit, like by cornering better, man, that VO2 max is like not hard at all. Uh, 
well, it's still hard, but it, relatively it's not hard. And if you can get that, we're in a race, because this is what they're doing to you, where you corner well, so you railed that corner and then you hit it. So everyone else who does that hard start, does that anaerobic power, they do the anaerobic and then the VO2 max, they're getting killed, right? And I've been this person, it is so hard. Uh, I've been the person on the other side too with uh, Raphael, yeah. San Rafael, there's that big turn to the right. And I would always go in first, it's on video. And you would see, I'd gap the field and everyone behind me would have to sprint back up. And they would do that over and over and over and over again. And uh, that allowed, so on the climbs then, the, the short climb did not hurt me as much because I had extra gas, but they're still going hard, right? And that's that thing stacks up in a race. If, I mean, just imagine a trainer would work out. If you had every hard start, be like, 25% less, mm -hmm. it, it, it's suddenly like the, the workout level goes down a few points. It is so much easier. Uh, yes. But it's That's also a life scary lesson. to turn really fast. That's a life lesson too. I, a life lesson in terms of uh, race acumen. I mean, you, you can learn in my early days, I, I favor, or I fancied myself a, a breakaway artist. And over time I got pretty good at doing it. <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't good at it to start with. I've, I was downright terrible because I thought I had to punch so hard and hold it for so long to, you know, first establish the gap, grow the gap, then settle in that I'd blow myself up. So it's the same idea. I mean, that, that hard start was too hard. And because of it, you know, I hobbled, hobbled myself and I got reclaimed and pushed through the washing machine and maybe tried to do it again. But over time you learn that just by dialing it back a little bit. And, and a lot of those hard start workouts still have an initial effort of 150 or 140 or 130. And that's intentional, not because I want you to be able to do, you know, start at 130, then next week do 140s and next week do 150s. That, that's part of it, but also to recognize that, man, when I do 150s, it cripples me. But when I do 140s, I can really hang in for the rest of that interval. So when you get out on the race course, you recognize, I don't want to, I don't want to bury myself quite so deeply. I'm going to hold back just a little bit, still going to you know, gut myself, but I know that if I don't go quite that hard, I can settle in and hold this effort and, and, and my chances of staying away grow exponentially. That's the, that's the game theory of racing. That is so much fun of how hard do I have to go in order to create the gap, but no harder than I have to. And if yeah. you go too less, you won't have the gap and the efforts wasted. That is, it's so fun. So what Chad's saying is he would go all in and then you just die. Cause you can't hold the, you do a 30 second, like 800 watt or 700 watt thing. It's really hard to hold threshold in for 20 minutes. Uh, like well, really, early really days, hard. early days, you don't have any basis for comparison anyway. You see other people do it and you think, well, they're, they're really suffering. That's the only way that's going to work. So you make yourself do that. And then you find out there are limits. You can only suffer so much and still, you know, maintain any, any, any gap at all. Wait, let me say this real fast. This is what Amber talked about last week too, is attacking when no one else, when it's a structural thing. So through some kind of thing where it gets narrowed, if you can attack then, then you can lower the amount of wattage you have to do for that sprint or for that gap. And that that's the best. So it's coming out like, uh, you know, there's a short, there's a, even a turn, a single file on the turn. You come out of that, there's a gap. It's amazing. Sorry, John. I just had to get that out. Yeah, that's a great point. This is another reason for sagging. So we talk about sagging usually in the context of sag climbing which basically means that you roll to the front of the field and then you let your, and you do that early, like before the climb starts right at the beginning of the climb. So then you can climb at a lower speed. And then by the top of the climb, hopefully finish so that you're somewhere mid or toward the back of the pack. If you sit at the back of the pack, you're going to get strung out at the beginning and it's going to be really tough. So it's basically like a position hack. So you put yourself in a position that's further up than you would normally be. And you let yourself fall back into that. The same thing applies to attacks though. Sagging doesn't just apply to climbing. It also is a really good thing to implement in attacks. So if you're trying to withstand attacks instead of trying to establish a breakaway, and when people are attacking really hard, let yourself slide back and let a few people fill in those spots and then go in. Because if everybody else had to do a sharp anaerobic burst to be able to accelerate and snap onto that and then be able to maintain, well, you're one leg up on them because you didn't have to do that burst. So this sagging uh, tactic is something that you'll see savvy riders use in criteriums. Even watch a team like Legion. And when they are, like, if you look at anything when they're racing or anything, uh, when they show their action, when they're going through and their team has to accelerate and respond to something, you'll notice that Corey or Justin or whoever their protected rider is, 
is typically not at the very back of the field. They have riders behind them as well as riders in front of them. And then what happens when those attacks and surges happen is they let their protected rider fall through their group. So then they don't have to do those really hard sprints. So Corey or Justin might go from mid pack back to the back of the, or I should say mid group of their team and might let themselves drift to the far back of it when the field accelerates. But then after that, they work together to reposition that rider into a comfortable middle ground. So then they have that suspension, so to speak, to be able to go forward and backward and not have to mimic perfectly the efforts of the field. It's a, it's a That's really, it, yeah. And it's a really important thing for cyclists to learn. And people will get really angry at you, by the way, when you try to do this and, and like the fields on the gas and you're moving to the side, people will not want to go in front of you and fill the gap that you've created. Don't let their words change how you ride, be smart and do what you know is best and let them fill that gap because chances are they're, they're not going to want to let it go. And even if they're angry, they'll end up going around you and they'll doing that. And then when they do that, Hey, that's one less match in their matchbook. And that's one more that you saved. I had so many people racing in Northern California. You're dropping wheels. Why are you doing this? Like, don't open that gap. What are you doing? And I'm, I'm, I can, it's a flat course. I've had like a 360 <laughs> FTP uh, or more at, at sea level. I can do that. I'm doing this on purpose. And oftentimes too, I do that gap because I know they're going to come around and fill it. And then they got to burn a match. And uh, I know the people that yelled at me, I beat them in the race. Like it's, that's it. Just because you're dropping a wheel in a race doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing or you can't hold it. Uh, it might be, you know, exactly what you're doing. And that's more game theory, right? Who's going to have the bigger gap? This actually happened in one of the, I think it was like Golden Golden City something, the three days uh, circuit race, or I forget what it is. But anyways, somebody was on my wheel the whole time because I just won a bunch of races and they just stuck to my wheel the whole time and anywhere I would go. So what I did is I just dropped off the back of the field and I was like, one of us is going to like just be out of the race and I was going to make it be them. Cause I would have to, I, or I was going to do is attack them and it worked. I, you can see it on video. I just dropped back and eventually they're like, okay, I'm going to go up and stop following him. Cause you can make it so hard for them. I don't know. Someone else could say you, you're not going to, you are not, man, this is hard talking today. Someone else could say, oh, you just can't keep up with the race. But what I was doing and dropping back was very tactical in order to get somebody off my wheel so that I didn't have a follower the whole race that would then beat me in a sprint. Yeah. I'm talking about Copperopolis. Nope. No. Yeah. It's three days. Nate, Chad, do you have anything else to add to this one? I don't think so. No. Cool. That's a good question. And hopefully it helped you. You can do those efforts, but remember replicating your efforts and training that you experience in the race isn't necessarily going to be the key differentiator. In many cases, it's those soft skills that we're talking about. Chances are you already got the fitness of the 340 FTP. Uh, chances are you've got that in place. So look at the soft skills and then sure, make sure that you aren't those efforts aren't foreign to you in training, but just know that doing them in training, isn't going to be the panacea. It isn't going to fix everything for you. Um, it's about positioning and being savvy like coach Chad, Chad, I miss when you race, man, mm. it's good it's, stuff. Imagine to the race analysis we could get on Chad, mate. It'd be exciting, right? We could have like good proper stuff. Speaking of race <clears throat> air center, just air center. It's such, such a repeated course and it's such a basic course that really all you have to rely on is strategy. Yeah, it's fun. Speaking of race analysis, by the way, we have one coming up this week, and then we have another one coming up the next week. Reckon we're back on a weekly cadence. Racing is back. It's exciting stuff. This week, we're going to see Keegan Swenson's fat tire crit win. Uh, so if anybody has gone on YouTube and you've seen the video of the cyclist that toast bread, Robert Forsteman, I believe the German track cyclist, and they basically, he has to maintain 700 Watts for as long as he can to toast the bread. And the toast is like very lightly toasted at the end. It's not heavily toasted. He held it for about a minute. Granted, this was on like, you know, he just cold start. That's pretty tough. Uh, but Robert Forsteman is not small. In fact, I bet that one of his quadriceps is about the whole like circumference of Keegan. Yeah. If they could it's have chambered the heat, if they could have chambered the heat that his body was putting off, it would have lit that bread on fire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and to be clear to you, Robert Forsteman is, is not really focused on one minute efforts. That man is a sprinter of shorter durations, but still Keegan puts out more power than that in one minute during this fat tire crit and you get to see it. And it's pretty darn impressive. Uh, it's really cool. So <laughs> tiny little bird leg, ostrich leg Keegan was able to do all that. It's pretty good stuff. They're it's a good tiny. race analysis. Hey, what's that? 
He does not have tiny legs. He does. He has extremely tiny legs. I think his I think his calves are about as big as my forearms. You'll see. Yeah, I calves, make fun of yes. all the time. Quads, no. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So it'll be a good race analysis. Stay tuned for that. We have more coming, more crits. One of our employees, Zach, uh, fast racer in NorCal. We're going to get to see a lot of his races. It's going to be great. Uh, We're also, and I'm just going to put this out there now. We are interested in reviewing race analysis from all of you that are racing. And we're going to have a system where you'll be able to upload your race files and your video. And then we'll be able to look at that and analyze it with you. And Ivy is going to be helping us with that. Ivy's a super savvy crit racer. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I can't wait. And thanks Ivy in the live chat. Okay. Forest question. It says, Hey, trainer road crew, five stars. It's always in all the things, literally everything I know about cycling, training, nutrition, racing bikes. I have learned from your ecosystem. I'm a fan for life. So keep up the good work. It says I've yes, that's the goal. I've recently noticed that after long duration efforts, it takes a lot of time to be able to ramp down physically. For example, last Sunday, I did an approximately three and a half hour ride with an IF of 0.87. The ride was 9.30 AM to around 1 PM. I did take in some caffeine, but nothing really out of the, or- out of the ordinary. I feel, excuse me, I feel the ride for 80 to 90 grams of carbs per hour, had a recovery shake and a good lunch thereafter. Then I worked in my yard for a few hours, building a fence, took my five-year-old daughter on a bike ride and finished the day by taking the family out to dinner. I basically ate two meals all day. So, you know, standard dad, homeowner, cyclist weekend day. I then went to bed around 10 PM, but still felt like I had a rapid heartbeat and had a hard time falling and staying asleep. I was physically feeling pretty tired, but could not seem to slow my systems down. This seems to be a pretty common theme. Anytime I have a long and hard day. So my main question is, is this normal? What's going on here in the body and any recommendations on how to kickstart the body back into a state where it can better recover. I have some pretty heavy weeks coming up and prep for BWR Belgium waffle ride, North Carolina. So I'm hoping to gain some additional insight into the recovery process, looking to optimize my next three to four weeks prior to the taper into that. I've, Thanks again I've, for everything you do from forest. Sorry. Nate. I didn't see the last line. I have, I, no one should do this, but I've heard people, uh, say, this is a reason why master athletes dope is they want to do their ride and then they want to like do the rest of their day inside of it. Um, mm-hmm. If you decide to do like testosterone replacement, don't race in any races against anyone else. You can be by yourself and have a doctor do that, all that stuff. But it's really hard, right? It's so hard to do a ride in the morning and then be a dad, be a husband, be a friend, um, be a mom, a lot, be a, yeah, be a mom. Yeah. Sorry. Um, it's a lot easier. I've done this before you, you ride and you just lay down all day, like the pro life <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you watch TV and you eat and you're just kind of like, Oh, I gotta go to the fridge and this is hard. Um, yeah, the, the other parts of life, and this is where we talk about too, is not everyone can handle the same kind of stress. And it's a lot to do about the stuff outside of the training rather than inside. But Chad, I think you have, you have mm-hmm. something I can just be quiet for for a while, huh? No, it, not for too long, but that's <laughs> those are solid points. I mean, I, I, I make the mistake far too often of prioritizing a big workout ahead of my day when my day is packed full of a lot of things I'd like to do. And I end up not getting to them because I'm completely wasted. So and if I do get to them, they're not enjoyed the way they would be because, well, I'm completely wasted. So I have to fight my way through it. Um, Wait, I do want to point out when you say completely wasted, <laughs> yeah. let's clarify. Is this so- <laughs> we're having to put a, we're having to put a lot of clarifying statements on Chad today. <laughs> spent. How's that? Completely spent. <laughs> there we go. I like that. Yeah, uh, and, and let, you tell me, Nate, this guy did three and a half hours at an IF of 0.87. That to me suggests it's probably time to reassess. Cause that's a, that's a real yeah. high IF for three and a half hours. Mm-hmm. But uh, either way, it was an intense ride. I I get that. And that's, that's the point we're taking home. Um, so, um, sports plug plug. time to go into uh, trainer road, early access, click AIFTP detection. Yes. Click that button. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then see what your new FTP is because I agree 0.87 for that long. For three hours. I was going to try to steer you there so that you could plug that more naturally, but you got it. You know, I'm slow. I'm <laughs> Adderall's okay. in me now, so I don't know what's wrong. It's kicking in. Yeah. Okay. So for us, uh, what, what we're talking about here, what you're talking about is reestablishing your pre-exercise parasympathetic rest and digest state. So I'm pretty sure that's one of Amber's words. I'm not, not sure it's, it's been uttered a lot. It's come out of her mouth quite a lot because that's the, the, that it's real. It's, it's what it is. So to put it another way, it, we're basically manipulating our autonomic nervous systems predominant state. So sympathetic versus parasympathetic, which is the the one that's in charge at the moment and exercise 
moves us toward that sympathetic state and, and it does a lot of things. It mobilizes, it helps us utilize fuel sources, elevates our heart rate, our respiration rate, breathing rate, or all that is respiration rate, et cetera. So what facilitates this transition between these autonomic states? Uh, and basically it comes down to catecholamines and specifically norepinephrine and epinephrine, which are also termed noradrenaline or adrenaline or adrenaline or adrenaline. There's, there's so many things. If there's a nor before it, I'm talking about the N one. <laughs> if there's an E before it or an A, I'm talking about the other one, but uh, I'll, I'll vacillate between those terms often enough. I'm pretty sure everyone will follow along just fine. Um, and I'm going to do it looking at a handful of studies going to jump around a bit on the timeline too. So 2011, Shah Savar and colleagues looked at changes in catecholamines after intensive physical activity. And they did so in 14 young athletes. They had them do a Bruce test, which is a treadmill test that basically gets faster and steeper as it goes. And it pushes athletes, in this case, athletes to a point of exhaustion. And in their cases, they averaged about 16 minutes before they fell apart. And then they looked at the epinephrine and norepinephrine levels prior to the Bruce test, post Bruce test immediately one day after, and then two days after, and their findings were that extreme exhaustive aerobic exercise, something we're all quite familiar with significantly increases both epinephrine and norepinephrine levels up to two days post. And they only measured it two days. So maybe longer. And they, they also concluded that changes in catecholamines may be influenced by the duration and the intensity of the exercise and the psychological state of the athlete beforehand because catecholamines are released in response to both physical and emotional stress, really just stress. Jonathan. So is, is, is that inferring that we could chronically be in a state of compared to a person that is not training and doing uh, hard work regularly. And we're talking about like aerobic training that mm -hmm. we could be in like a constantly elevated state where a more sympathetic than parasympathetic state. Entirely. Yep. And I, I, I came across a, an actual physiological phenomenon that I'll get to in a bit mm -hmm. that is new, is new to me. Pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, so on top of this, even just the anticipation of exercise to come can actually increase catecholamine release. We've talked about that before. I don't think we <laughs> felt that <laughs> couched it in the terms of catecholamines, but I think we were talking about cortisol all the time, but the fact is the body responds to perceived, uh, insults, right? Just, just psychological stress. So the minor point being is that incoming levels of catecholamines will very likely impact both what's going on during exercise, as well as post-exercise levels of these very same hormones. And this is favorable while we're working out, while we need this to be going on. It's not so favorable, favorable after exercise cessation. Also your nutritional state, and this typically revolves around hypoglycemia. So low blood sugar levels can increase your catecholamine levels, hypoxia. So if you find yourself in a low oxygen pressure situation. If you're at altitude, if for whatever reason you're exposing yourself to, to low PO, PO2 or whatever the term is, that, that can increase your catecholamine levels. Caffeine can as well. All these things can, can bump up those epinephrine, norepinephrine levels, but let's, let's turn this back toward exercise specifically and look at a 2008 review by Zuhal and colleagues where they looked at the, uh, the effects of exercise, training, and gender on catecholamines. We're just going to focus on the exercise component of that. And what they noted was that exercise characteristics can elevate the levels of epinephrine, norepinephrine, anywhere from one and a half times, so just a, a little tick upward, to more than 20 times basal rates. So these are big changes, and it's dependent on what? What I just said, exercise characteristics, which are type, duration, and intensity of exercise. Add to this, and this is what I just hinted at, this physiological phenomenon called sports adrenal medulla, which basically says that endurance training or really exercise training can actually increase our capacities to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine, adrenaline, noradrenaline. So you know, through training, we can actually increase the degree of our sympathetic response, which is what Jonathan suggested just there. So if we get back to the exercise characteristics that can actually exert influence over the release of these catecholamines, uh, the type of exercise. And interestingly, I found a study by Davies in 1974 that noted that catecholamine concentrations were actually higher when the exercise was carried out with the arms than the legs, which, I mean, just consider the differences in, in the catecholamine response between something like cross-country skiing or swimming. And then of course, cycling and, and my 
point here. I don't even have one. I'm not even sure. I'm just fascinated by the sensitivity of catecholamine release. It's, it's, it's quite sensitive. When we look at duration, a 1982 uh, study by Coivisto, and then actually a prior one in 1975 by Galbo, demonstrated that regardless of the intensity, as long as we hold VO2 constant, so our level of oxygen uptake constants, steady state work, that plasma norepinephrine levels continuously increased all the way to exhaustion. So they only went up and adrenaline was along for that ride too, just not at as fast a rate. So it just goes up, 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 up. Then when it comes to intensity, I'll just quote Zuhal. And, and this is Zuhal in reference to a trio of studies where he states adrenaline and noradrenaline concentrations seem to be conditioned by the relative power of the exercise. So to restate that it's, it's these catecholamines, these stress hormones rise right along with the intensity of the work we're doing. And at what rate you might ask, right? And the review noted that circulating norepinephrine level concentrations, epinephrine concentrations increase exponentially with exercise intensity. So we're talking big ticks upwards, kind of like wind resistance work a lot harder for, well, either way you get the relation. Jonathan. This is Jonathan. something John. that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just look it, like he knows I'm looking at him. <laughs> uh, this is something that after criteria, this so Tuesday night world style criteriums tend to be a common thing that we see. Mm. I struggle with sleeping so much after those, like it is really hard to go to sleep. I feel like my, my core body temps high, but then I just can't rev down mm -hmm. and I, and I can go and do a sweet spot workout and at the same time, a different night and I can, it's fine and I can sleep well. Uh, so just personal anecdote to this. And I'm trying, what I'm trying to do here is connect a lot of you that are listening to this. You've probably felt this when you've done more intense work. And mm -hmm. this is good to know that there is some science behind the fact that more intensity does indeed increase the amount well, it does. That, that we experience. It, it for sure does. I mean, duration intensity totally bear significant effects on, on the, the release of these sympathetic fight or flight uh, hormones. And, and it makes sense because we need more fuel. We need more heartbeats. We need more breaths per minute because we're doing more work. So yes. In fact, I'll wrap this up by pointing out what Zuhal pointed out is that intensity is probably the biggest hitter in this whole catecholamine ball game. Mm. So, you know, when, when it comes to clearance and, and this has me interested, Jonathan, to, uh, it's probably tied to the intensity, but I wonder if you did anything differently on those nights where you wound down a little more effectively. So let's talk about the clearance of these stress hormones, which is really just the reversal of this uh, sympathetic emphasis. And this was, these are all older studies too. 1979, Hagberg and colleagues studied the clearance of specifically norepinephrine during recovery. And they were trying to determine if the clearance rate or the accumulation rate, you know, affected the rate of turnover more. And really that doesn't, we don't care about that. But what I took from this paper and, and other related papers is, to reduce stress hormone levels, we have to do the opposite of the things that elevate those stress hormone levels. I mean, right? That, that, it, it seems so obvious, but it is just that simple. Reduce your intensity, feed yourself, gradually deescalate, but don't necessarily tank your blood flow, your heart rate, your breathing rate. In other words, cool down and, and simply begin your recovery process. And that's comprised of all the obvious things. Nutrition, rehydration, relaxation, and all the forms you can get it. Maybe an overlooked one is cooling, either via the, the ambient effects of, uh, of your environment or artificial ones. I, I, and I think back to when I was in Italy and just dying in my hotel room, I used cold, damp towels and took a nap. I woke up feeling refreshed and I actually slept quite well that night. I remember. Good visual. Yes, I, I was in Italy. <laughs> no, that, uh, remember, uh, what is it, uh, Single Track 6, John? Oh, wow. Oh, yes. Tell that story. Same thing. It was so hot. It was so, we were in. It's impossibly we, hot. We got it. It was like a nice looking ski lodge. And I figured, man, this is going to be really nice. And we got in and there was no AC. And we're like, oh, okay. don't we're, have AC. we're in Canada and, and <laughs> I guess from the mountains. And this is mostly a winter place. I get it. And we're like, well, we at least got to have fans. So we called down to the front desk. We're like, hey, we need some fans over here. And there's no Walmart nearby. We're like in remote places. <laughs> There's no store that would sell them. And they were like, yeah, you got one. You, you, they're, they're in your closet. So we opened up the closet and it was literally, I mean, it was not much larger than one of the handheld fans that you would have that like you carry around with you. And that's all we had. And the Chad's reaction, but I, I swear that it would probably do some damage to us if we had these things on the internet, Nate, but it mm. would create like entertaining content if we could have a camera crew following us when we were going through those oh, scenarios. I know, I should have took pictures. So Chad, what he did is he took a bladder from one of his race packs 
He filled it with water. He froze it and he tied it around his neck and put it on his chest. <laughs> and he walked around That's just desperate. like watching TV. He like had his laptop because it was in between. We're just like chilling, right? Because we had the, the race days. And he just yeah. have it laying on him like a big, huge necklace <laughs> uh, bladder <laughs> on his chest. Race uh, days in hot environments coming back to a hot hotel. I mean, we had to be working in high 80s, low 90s. So you come, yeah. come back, you're on fire and there's no chance of cooling down. You go into a room where there's no air circulation because we yeah. couldn't get any wind moving through there. I mean, the lobby to its credit was, uh, the, or the hotel or not the hotel, the elevator lobby was air conditioned. So you could go lay out there and we did <laughs> all of us. Um, but I mean, what, what are you after? You want to lower your core temperature because that's going to bring with it a, a reduction in your heart rate, a reduction in your respiration rate. And this, all of these things to steer it back around to force question, uh, happen when you extend your cool down. So, so you didn't mention your cool down in, in everything that you described that you're doing. So I'm going to assume that it was either truncated or maybe didn't exist. And I can totally understand that because when you come back from a highly intense three and a half hour ride, last thing you want to do is noodle around for a while and cool down. So my suggestion would be if it's three and a half hours and you're, you know, five miles from home, dial it back start your cool down on the bike so that by the time you get home, you're already leaning toward that more parasympathetic state. You're already de-escalating everything. And you're trying to basically just encourage or facilitate that return to, to what's predominant, the parasympathetic, the rest and digest state. Nate, looks like yeah, you want I, to say something. Yeah, it's the next, I'm gonna take a live question before we go to the next one. So you do Okay, I've got one. some things to add on yep. this, if that's okay. Go for it. Uh, it sounds like a basic and available thing, but we overlook it, particularly if you're a busy person with a lot going on that day. And you're so like Chad talked about rolling back to the house. And if you can do that, absolutely do it. Personally speaking from anecdote, that's very beneficial and helping me reach a parasympathetic state earlier. However, the reality may be that you are rushing back to finish that ride because you've got other engagements that are on your calendar. So it's really, it's trying to get ahead of your day and planning your training so that you have that sort of time in there so that you can wind down a bit. So if you can try to get ahead of it and plan out so that you can get just set aside time for reaching a parasympathetic state, or at least more than what you're currently in. The other thing is <clears throat> cold showers just are, or, or a cold bath, whatever it might be. We've talked about ice baths for recovery and how there's not a whole lot of science behind them being beneficial. We've done that before on the podcast in terms of like recovery. Um, that said, it could be extremely beneficial to just lower your core temperature. And exactly. if you have a, and if you don't, if you can't do an ice bath, just do a cold shower, right? Uh, do something, something is better than nothing and helping you reduce that core temperature. Also, one thing that I'm thinking of is it's really easy to become undernourished and dehydrated. And if we look back at the rest of Forrest's question, he mentions that only ate two meals uh, throughout the day and you rode for three hours at a pretty high IF. I bet you burned a lot of calories. So you probably put yourself in a state, in a state where your body needs fuel and it's not getting enough fuel to be able to operate effectively and recover. And it's so easy to become dehydrated, particularly when you're dealing with these days where it's like, um, you know, you've got, like you mentioned, taking your daughter for a ride, going with the family to go do other things, soccer games, going to the store, doing all that. It's really tough. We lose a lot of, of liquid in our bodies through respiration, uh, not just through sweat. So I'm not saying like, look at your sweat rate and then figure it out. No, just anticipate the fact that you're going to use a whole lot of liquid. And as a result, you're also just describing him, <clears throat> excuse me, being in a catabolic state and catabolic state and the parasympathetic state go hand in hand. we just talked about the fact that hypoglycemia elevates catecholamine levels. So if you haven't eaten enough, just did three and a half hours at high intensity. I mean, that's, you gotta be pushing 2000 calories there and you compensated with two follow-up meals. And it sounds like you nourished really well on the bike and that covered the work that you were doing at the time, but the deficit created isn't really being addressed and that can affect stress levels post-workout. Absolutely. So those are uh, two or three tips Four. forgive me, ramp down and try to plan your day so that you have time to ramp down, make sure that you're nourishing yourself thereafter. And on those busy days, I don't know if it's a good idea to start measuring and trying to hit your marks perfectly. Give yourself extra room to work with. It's okay. And then with hydration, do as much as you can to, to give yourself an upper leg. 
even like simple stuff, like making sure that the rest of the day that you sip on something like, I don't know, like uh, one of the electrolyte mixes that you can get, whether it's Gatorade or whether it's, I don't know, liquid IV or something like that. Just make sure you're drinking something like that throughout the rest of the day, carry a bottle with you and make sure that you're just sipping with it. Small things because you're asking a lot of your body to be able to train really hard and then go throughout the rest of the time. Um, that's those, those are my takeaways from what Chad said and personal tips, Nate, you could just make it as simple as looking at in what ways are my body stressed, right? Is my body stressed right now and address those to the opposite of it. If I'm hungry, eat, if I'm dehydrated, hydrate. If I'm, uh, psychologically stressed, find ways to remove that stress mm -hmm. for the, like, I want to hear what you guys think too, but on those days where it's hard to eat, you're really busy. What I like to do is, uh, protein shakes. I like the on gold standard protein, very easy to pourable. It's like, I'll use some water and it's when I drink it too, I just have one this morning. I just drink it all at once or else it'll sit around and I'll come back to it later and it'll be like lukewarm and I won't like it. The other one, man, like fruit, so portable has fiber in it. Um, bananas, apples, real easy to take around, uh, berries. I really like that to kind of snack on too. And I can hydrate taste good. Yeah, exactly. And oh, that's another tip too with Amber. So Amber would take a like lemon lime flavored uh, electrolyte mix and mix it with chocolate or vanilla uh, protein powder. So you can get a little more salt and carbs, like after your rice or wherever you are in, inside of, you know, in your drink tastes a little bit different. And it's nice. And that's another tip, an easy thing you can do. Uh, when you have a busy day, like I do that all the times so we have to go somewhere with the kids. And I literally have like 90 seconds, right. Of like time. <laughs> so you can make your protein shake really fast. Um, oh, uh, by the way, a milk frother, if you guys ever use one of those to Good mix tip. your protein, you put the water in, I put the protein on top and I put creatine on top. And then I go for like 30 seconds. And I don't have to have like a zillion shakers. Cause I think the shakers always used. Right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. And it actually mixes it up better for me than a shaker. Those things are nice. like $8 and they're yeah. amazing. So I can do that. And then it grab like three, two, three bananas and you're good to go in the car. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not as good as a full meal, but it's, it's not bad. So Something's what do you two guys like? For, yeah. I'm not a big fan of bars too. Um, yeah. I like the, the protein and like fruit is my go-to like on the move, but what, what do you, or avocado toast too. That's, that takes a little bit longer, but I mean, I can make that fast. Uh, mm -hmm. John, I'll go with you, John. What do you like on those busy days to eat between? Yeah. Shakes is a, is, is a big thing for me. Uh, it's easy. I can also make it so that it's, I already have everything pre-mixed the night before. So I prep for my Saturdays, like it's a race day, because if I don't, then it ends up catching up with me and beating me. That's just how it goes. Cause my Saturdays are so busy with soccer games and everything else going on. So I have to plan ahead and I have, I'll have a mixer, like a shaker bottle and I'll have my protein in a bag and it's just easy and I can put it right in and I already have the liquid in there and it's done. And that makes it really easy. The other thing that I like to eat too, is, uh, we have like little things of hummus and pita bread, something like that. So then right mm -hmm. when I'm done too, I can get something that's savory because that's another, I know it sounds like I'm, I'm being picky here, but you just finished a ride where you took in a lot of sugar you probably don't feel like just taking in another sweet thing and just having like some hummus and carrots or pitas, uh, like little pita chip stuff. It's really quick and easy and a good snack. Uh, don't, I know that some people may be in a spot listening to this and they're trying to avoid snacking and I don't mean to push anything on you. So whatever you're trying to do, keep doing it. But if you're thinking of a time where it's like, I wonder if snacking is bad or, or not after a ride, let yourself have these things, particularly on these busy days. Cause chances are, you're not going to be able to nourish yourself appropriately. So having savory snacks. And then after that, a shake is usually what I do on my Saturdays and be able to get it in. Yeah, I do that's awesome. shakes as well. <clears throat> so afterward, I need something that's readily digestible. It doesn't take a lot of effort to prepare or to eat for that matter. And I'm with Jonathan and I think a lot of people and that I've had sweets for, you know, the bulk mm -hmm. of the ride, it's the last thing I want. So I just address that with, uh, the powder I use is a protein powder, uh, sorry, plant-based protein powder called cachava. It's not the cheapest stuff. It's a meal replacement, but man, it checks a lot of boxes. And then I actually dose a little bit extra peanut butter protein, but it's, it's no fat or it's very low fat. So they've, it's just the protein. And then of course, low fat milk. So try to keep the, the fat quantity down. So again, that it doesn't gum up the works and the 
the absorbability is quicker, but same idea. I use the peanut butter to kind of cut the sweet with a little bit of savory. Is that the PB fit or PB fit for the the powder? powder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I use. Some people don't know about that. Yeah, it is. It's they take peanut butter or peanuts and they like dehydrate it and they remove the fat, but you get protein and the taste of peanut butter. And Mm -hmm. so it's, it's brilliant. It's, you know, uh, a tablespoon of peanut butter is like what, 200 calories. It's, it's, I don't know if that's correct, but it's a lot. Uh, lot. so you get that taste, you put in anything like that was, I, I, I do that sometimes it's like I'm peanut butter. Everything's peanut butter for a week. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. But it's very nice. That's a huge pro tip, Chad, to, to cut down that sweet inside of it. And then what John said too about the hummus and the pita, I don't want to f- be picky. I fall in this trap. There's like adequate or like enough. Who wants enough and adequate? Like let's <laughs> let's have like something that tastes really good, right? Uh, yeah. I can be very sciencey and just be like, I will do exactly what I need for this grams of carbs. I don't care what it is. Kind of like the what is it? That Soylent product. That was popular mm-hmm. for a while. It's like, I don't need to eat meals anymore. I'll just drink this thing because that is all the things that I need. Uh, I, yeah, who, who wants that? Like, you should be proud of that, John. It's like, I, I want, you're like Italian. Like, I want to live life. I want to do yeah. uh, <laughs> amazing things rather than be a, an American who's just like, I want to work and accomplish my goals. Uh, yeah. You can do both. A, a personal thing that I think with nutrition, this is a personal thing. So, but I think that it's the things I do chronically that affect me more than the things I do acutely. So what I'm talking about there is that it's my habits over time that end up forming me rather than the one time that I do something different. And I think that it's also very healthy to allow yourself to deviate from your norm uh, within range, because if you just strictly, particularly with nutrition, hold yourself to just a really hard and fast rule all the time, it gets really tough to maintain. So yeah, absolutely. Let's go into Caleb's question. Or actually, Nate, you had a live question that you wanted to entertain. Yeah. So Patrick Baker says, is Chad this knowledgeable on beer or is he just an enthusiastic amateur drinker? So Chad, do you have any like science to to back this up? (laughs) Yes, Chad. So what is the difference between an IPA and a lager? Do you know one's an ale and one's an ale and one's a lager and IPA is going to be high, far higher in alcoholic content because I mean, what they had to shipping from India. So they had to boost the alcohol contents so by the time they got to where they were going, which I'm going to assume was the United States, England, I don't know, whatever, uh, that they weren't spoiled. Uh, mm-hmm. that's what they call the fermentation. It, and pale ale. Yeah, exactly. India pale ale More fermentation than. process is different. I think, uh, ales are bottom fermented and lagers are top fermented. That might be backwards, but now the days they flip the fermentation regardless of the, the ale or the, or the lager, but they're two ends of a spectrum, lagers and ales. What's your uh, favorite beer right now? Uh, I'm still just big on double and triple IPAs. So anything I can get triple. my hands on. Yeah. Just big booze. <laughs> I, I drink a beer. That's it. A beer. So I want that beer to have as much punch as possible. And of course, I chase it with bourbon, but that's a whole other conversation. It's like that. <laughs> It's like when people fill their uh, their wine glasses all the way up and I'm like, oh, it's just one yeah. glass of wine. You just have one. Oh, that's it. Exactly. One. So if you don't cut it's your pizza, it's glass. just one piece of pizza. It's the same idea. Yeah. You can actually put uh, a whole bottle of wine in like a Pinot glass. It's, it's just one glass. <laughs> that's real. Oh, boy. That yeah. is real. We're getting off the rails. Nate actually this, offered, this, by the way. This, <laughs> sorry, Chad, please. I don't want to interrupt. Go ahead. Just, just a side note. Nate asked me earlier if I had any beers around, and it made me think of this coffee mug that Amaret came across in Coeur d'Alene the other day that said, definitely not coffee. <laughs> I was going to get it for the podcast. I thought it'd be you should get it. too obvious. Uh, I do remember. So actually, sorry, quick backstory. I know we're deviating here. We'll get back. But uh, early on in the podcast, when we started to go live, that incurred a lot of stress on Chad. And I remember him showing up and he had his mm. trainer road mug. And I looked over at it and I saw that it was very bubbly coffee. And I was like, Chad, that doesn't really look it's, like coffee. It's foamy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it, 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 Chad had a lot of stress he was dealing with being live on the air and it was yeah. making it more manageable. So I'm not above using a crutch. And, and yeah, <laughs> He's for a little while, for a little he while. Was doping. <laughs> it, it didn't so play so out cut that out too. <laughs> yeah. yes. It just kind of affects the rest of your day though. It kind of takes the wind out of your sails. So it didn't last, but it did help me through a tough, a tough time. <laughs> there we go. All you right. Feel good uh, now though, right? <laughs> yeah yeah we're only yeah, at 15 yeah okay anyway go ahead we're off the, 
more people. It Nate actually said, if we get more likes on the YouTube video, so everybody that's watching right now, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If we get more than I say, uh, hundred, we hit a hundred because okay. that's not even yeah. Then Chad, if you we can, hit a hundred, I want to see Chad drink a beer. Or Chad, it's okay <laughs> to get a beer if we hit a hundred likes. We only have like really still fifty we minutes. We do the left. podcast at four p.m. and then oh, there we go. No problem. Let's get into Caleb's question. He says, I have a question about breathing during rest intervals. Anyone who has played team sports or ran will have probably had the experience of being told to put their hands on their head right after an effort when they're breathing heavily. The logic being, and I, I don't, I want to make sure that we reinforce this logic and assumption. We're not talking science here. The logic behind this being stretching your arms out allows you to take larger breaths that you, and you won't be constricting your lungs. I've never seen any proof of this concept though. However, because of my time playing team sports where I was given this directive during rest intervals of an indoor interval workout, I will instinctively sit up and put my hands on my head while I am catching my breath. So is there any evidence to support the practice of putting your hands on your head during rest intervals? Should I be keeping my hands on the bars or does it even matter at all? And I should just be default and I should just default to my personal preference. Big thanks to the entire train road team for all that you do. Nate, did you want to jump in first? I know the answer. I don't, there's no notes on this, but I actually know the answer is, uh, this is actually BS. It, it, it slows down your recovery to put your hands up. The best is it's like, uh, laying down and, uh, not moving is the best way to recover. And I know every high school coach told you to go like hands above your head. Um, but they've, uh, it's just, they've done this with studies. Um, we can pull it up later. I don't have it with me, but I'm really I've got fairly confident that this is that it is not better to put your hands up and it does not do what studies. coaches think it does oh okay. it's got yeah. lots of studies where the, yeah where are the there oh, go. wait. caleb's question okay i'm looking at the wrong question ah. <laughs> yeah go ahead there's there's five studies we're, right there we're rough Four. today i'm glad chad's on it nate and i are a little rough go ahead okay. chad <laughs> no no actually nate nailed all those points so uh, let's just drive them home Quick aside before we get into it, but do you know what else can affect your catecholamine levels? Because it's <laughs> posture. I mean, at rest, catecholamine levels are actually lower when sitting or lying than when standing. So right out of the gates, I mean, posture actually has an effect on our catecholamine levels. And I mentioned this because the question here really revolves around posture. That's what we're talking about. So, you know, I'm spent, I'm gassed, I can't get my breath. Does my posture affect this? I mean, whether or not you recognize that being the question, it is the question. So this is very much along the lines of the past discussion that we had, uh, where I think we were talking about CrossFit workouts and we talked about hands on knees and it was the same thing. Coach said, put your arms up or, or, uh, what are they, what, what else do these fonts of wisdom tell us like to, uh, to lean over and put your hands on your it knees. off or no, yeah. it's <laughs> always walk around. Yeah. You got, yeah. you can't lay yeah, down. Keep moving. Yeah. Keep moving. Keep moving. So the, the, the takeaway is that unburdening the breathing muscles, or at least the takeaway from that previous discussion on CrossFit hands on knees is that unburdening the breathing muscles of their postural support actually hastened recovery. It, it did. This is, this is demonstrated. So I'm actually going to suggest just the opposite of what you're proposing rather than hands on the head. I say, keep your hands on the bars of the bike. And I'm going to suggest it for four reasons or rather four research studies that back up my logic and Nate's logic. So first, uh, let's go in order with these ones. 1988 study by Nardone and Shiapati talked about postural adjustments during standing. And, and obviously, just standing requires muscle contraction. And therefore, it requires oxygen consumption. But interestingly, there are all sorts of anticipatory muscle activities that take place. So for example, if you're in, in this study, when you're preparing to stand on tiptoes versus preparing to rock back on your heels, these movements are preceded by prepare, uh, preparatory muscle activity, unless the subjects held onto the frame of the platform that they're actually using in this study to measure muscle activity. And what this suggests to me is that by simply creating stability elsewhere, otherwise working muscles can relax, can recover. So again, this is probably just the opposite of hands on head. This is hands on bars or elbows on bars. So I mean, you're not competing in a UCI sanctioned event. Um, but these are both relative equivalents to the hands on knees in CrossFit that we were talking about. Then, uh, come forward a, a little over decade, 2002 to Abraham and call colleagues, respiratory related activation of abdominal muscles during exercise. So now we're talking about the, the, the abdominal muscles playing a role in regulating our ventilatory response. 
in or uh, t- toward progressive intensity on the bike. So to put, put it really simply, the harder we work, the harder they work. Okay. So what's relevant is that there's a lot of overlap between our breathing muscles and our postural muscles. And for example, the external obliques, the rectus abdominis, your, your six pack, and these are the muscles that they analyzed play a part in both. So we're asking, <laughs> we're asking these muscles and other muscles to perform double duty, right? We want postural support from them and we want breathing. So what I took from this study is that if we can eliminate some of the responsibility of the breathing muscles, then recovery can come more quickly, be more thorough. Same idea. Then 2004, another study, this is Urquhart and Hodges looked at how the, your, your postural activity of your abdominals actually varies between regions of the abdominal muscles and between body positions. So the title basically says it all different postures, different muscular loads. Specifically though, they noted that the abdominals play a really important role in movement of the low back and the hips, which I translated to, they also play a really key role in stabilization of the low back and the hips. So these researchers looked at some of the deeper abdominal muscles, transverse abdominis, internal obliques, and then they did include the external obliques also, and they did it during rapid shoulder movements. And and they found that there were different abdominal responses based on whether the participants were standing or seated specifically that while they were seated, the recruitment was delayed. And to me, this says that delayed recruitment means less time under contraction, less work, lower physiological toll. So the point I'm trying to make is that even sitting on the bike can actually, actually lessen our contribution from our other muscles, from our postural, from our breathing and from our, you know, more obvious workers, our legs. So facilitating recovery on the bike can actually be accomplished by sitting and coasting, you know, if it's descending, if it's drafting, if it's rolling, even if it means you're, you're losing speed. And then of course, sitting on a trainer or a turbo and even while backpedaling or, or pedaling lightly, the point is that muscles that stabilize the low back and the hips or your torso and trunk do less work while you're seated, very probably even more so when stabilized with your arms just makes sense to me. And then finally, I'll wrap it up with Oz Jenner's study in 2012, where they looked at the contribution of resting quote, resting muscles to the VO two slow component during high intensity cycling, something that should resonate deeply with all of us. And if you'll recall the, the VO two slow component is, is effectively, it's just a de- decline in efficiency. Basically we, we can work at a steady rate, but as long as that rate takes place above FTP above critical power, our oxygen consumption just grows and grows and grows, even though we're doing the same amount of work. So an example would be if you're doing uh, 108% repeats, and you drag out that repeat for five versus six versus eight minutes, your VO two max actually draws nearer and nearer and nearer. The longer those go on, you're not working any harder, but your efficiency is declining and your oxygen cost is, is rising. And what's of note here is that even our arms, and this is what they looked at the biceps draw oxygen and contribute to an increase in this VO two slow component. So my takeaway is that if our arms are a resource suck, then you can bet our postural muscles are one as well. And I'll, I'll sound like a broken record here, but recovery is an aerobic process and our aerobic resources are limited. So why dedicate any of them to muscles unnecessarily? Why rob these working muscles of the more rapid recovery, or perhaps just a bit more complete recovery. If the next effort is, you know, super imminent, why not reduce their requirements when possible? A safe bet at all times is to give yourself the best chance to recover, right? Chad, we're not just talking in between workouts or in between training phases, but then we're also talking about in between intervals. If well, just even think about what it, what it's like when you're doing, you know, like a 90% effort with your hands on the bars and you sit up and continue that 90% effort, everything gets a little bit harder and yeah, mm-hmm. you're not as biomechanically leveraged as well. I, I get that, but you're also now tasking muscles that didn't have to do work with work. Yep. It's, uh, yeah. I think we've all seen it too. You get on the trainer, you sit up and you think that it might be beneficial or something else. Uh, it's an easy way to look at it is just look at your heart rate. And a lot of the time it, if you're cruising at the same rate and then you just sit up and change that posture, your heart rate will go up. It's, it's not uncommon. So yeah, Chad, there's a good the science to back up the of, logic that sorry, exists with sorry, this. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Mike. You were done. A uh, study in uh, 2019, what they did is they had people run for four minutes at 90, 95% heart rate with three minutes of passive recovery, um, two ways, one with hands on knees, one with hands on head. And what they did is measured how low. Nate, can you move your mic up to you? Sorry. Yes. Does this not, is this not good? There you go. Better. Okay. Um, 
what they did is they measured uh, how much your heart recovery is, just what John just said, and hands on knee, one. And it was significant, like 10 beats per minute in that mm-hmm. one 60 seconds. And that, it, you ever go between intervals and you, like, you look at your heart rate and you see like in the rest period, like how low it goes back. And sometimes when it doesn't go low, you're like, uh-oh, this is going to be really hard. Uh, <laughs> but when it does go really low, you feel good. Like, yeah, I can do the next one. I'm, I, I can do more intervals at this. So that's but another a- one testing this exact thing with what you want, a lower heart rate between intervals. There's a physiological trade-off with that too. So there are times where we actually want to maintain a high oxygen uptake. So we want to keep on working. We don't necessarily want our heart rate to fall. And that's kind of what we were talking about earlier. When you move into the specialty phases, you want to be able to do a ton of work without a ton of recovery. And it's the same idea. So there are points and and don't question it when you encounter it in a workout where the recovery may seem insufficient, where your heart rate doesn't come down to where you'd like it to come down. And you think therefore your work's going to be a little less productive it's intentional and, and it's forcing you to still be productive, even though you don't get to get as comfortably recovered as you might like. But don't put your hands on your head <laughs> thinking that's going to make you like your FTP higher. Like it's, it is less yeah. recovery, but it's the, it's the power of the interval that's going to make you faster inside of it. So still recover as much as you can. And yeah. the progression levels are going to push it so that it's the right amount for you. Like, and, and they should to, push like, it pedal in the recovery or something like that. Like, sure. And they, they should push it in such a way that you want to, to soak up as much recovery as possible. You wouldn't even consider taking your hands off the bars because you recognize as soon as they come off the bars, Oh, this is already more uncomfortable. Hands are back on the bars. Ideally mm-hmm. you're working hard enough that you don't even get to, uh, consider changes in po- posture. For sure. Dad, we hit 102 likes. So what does that mean? Oh, I have to drink beer. <laughs> don't sure have to as your uh, CEO. I will I mean, drink. I want to. <laughs> I'll drink one for everybody at about four o'clock this afternoon. So, is that, and when he says you, you drink one hours. for everybody, I just want to clarify, yeah, one, he doesn't mean drink one for each person. <laughs> 102? <laughs> I better get cracking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, Chad, we've had to caveat a whole lot of things here. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks everybody for joining us in the live chat. Um, we have one more question, <clears throat> Chad, I'm not sure if we want to cover one this week or if we want to push it to the following and maybe we can just answer some rapid fire questions. The audience has that are joining us in the live chat. What do you say? Uh, we, we can cover it. I don't, it's not, it's kind of an easy question to answer. I mean, we don't, I don't know that we need to dive on this one. I think we can all just cool. kind of talk about how we deal with urgency during the, I don't cool. give anything away if you want to. Yeah. I'll get into it then. Van said, mm-hmm. had a question about hydration and finding balance between over and under hydration, uh, meaning over hydrating versus under hydrating, not hydrating during over unders <laughs> again. <laughs> uh, when I do my trainer road workouts, I drink about 22 to 26 ounces of sports drink an hour with two to three gels an hour. I also use a fan for cooling and I feel like this should be just right, but I always have to stop multiple times a workout to pee. Does this mean I'm over hydrating? And shouldn't I be losing a lot through sweat so I wouldn't have to pee? What's weird is that the pee varies in color, but I always end up having to go. It wouldn't be so bad if it was just the workouts, but it happens in events too. I've had to stop to pee right when the hitters are, were, were going up the road during a Fondo, and that was my race over. So everyone always says we have to hydrate, but I almost feel like I have to pee, or almost always feeling like I have to pee uh, means that maybe I'm doing too much. I drink when I'm thirsty throughout the day. So I'm guessing about 40 ounces a day outside of my workouts. Help me find the right amount. Thanks for the great product. It helped me stay motivated and fit and able to tackle long events, even on just four to eight hours a week. Way to go. I like that. Five stars all around. Don't have to put in big volume to get big results. Good job, man. Uh, Okay. Chad, where do you want to start with this one? Really? kind of want to keep this one quite simple and just recognize, cause we've talked about this a uh, number of times that hydration is a balance between the water, not, not the fluid, but the water that you ingest and sodium levels. So if those two things are out of balance, then hydration or hyperhydration or dehydration are all things that are on the table. So the, <clears throat> so the big push these days is to maintain sodium levels and with good reason, because sodium is the electrolyte that circulates in our uh, extracellular space. So the interstitial fluid, so it's outside of the cells and it's this fluid that we lose or give up when we offload heat via sweating. So if we don't have, and then of course on the inside of the cells, there's potassium, there's a whole sodium potassium pump and this, uh, osmotic gradient and, and all these technical things that take place. But the fact is, if we don't have enough sodium, we can't hold water. 
so you're, you're pushing water through the system. You're not pushing it to these extracellular spaces where they would be retained if you had enough sodium to retain them. So if you're not managing your sodium balance with your water intake, then exactly what's going to happen is, is what's happening to you, man, you're just going to whiz it all out. So and it's for this reason that people test sodium levels these days and people shed sodium at different rates too. We have these little ducks in our sweat glands that, you know, basically genetically determine, I don't think this is something we can epigenetically influence how much of our sodium goes to our skin and is effectively sweated off and how much actually goes back into the body. So if you happen to be a profuse sweater and one who hemorrhages a lot of sodium during your sweating, then it's really going to be challenging for you to hydrate if you're not closely monitoring your sodium levels. Mm. Yeah. I don't have anything to add to this other than I've experienced exactly what Chad has said. So a similar case to you, Van. Yeah. A killer resource on this is always precision hydration. They have a lot of, a lot of interesting information. And in fact, most of what I just told you is probably from uh, one of Abby Coleman's articles or Andy Blow's articles. Uh, yeah. So with this, the sports drink, if they're doing maybe like Gatorade or something, they might not have the mm -hmm. level of sodium that uh, they might need more sodium. So they could buy another product like we, I think we all like precision hydration, add that to water or that sports drink and play with that and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And Alan Lim's site, uh, was he Osmo now or no scratch? No scratch. Yeah. Scratch. scratch yeah. yeah. Same thing. Yeah, scratch. A lot of really good blog resource. Yep. I do have a, uh, I went to a motocross as a little kid. I went to a motocross clinic and it was in Southern California and it was in the middle of the winter. And it was like 90 something degrees down there. They were having a heat wave in the middle of the winter and I was not used to it. I was wearing really hot. It's like, uh, you know, zero wind coming through protective gear the whole time. And I drank myself probably into some sort of like a hyponutremic state because I was having to stop. And I basically missed the majority of the camp with that. The, the pro rider was Jeff Emig. He was like my idol. I was super excited and I missed the majority of it because I was having to constantly go to the bathroom the whole time, but I had no clue. And they were just saying, drink water, drink water. And I was just downing things of water nonstop and not taking in salt. And as a result, it's just run right through me. It's like so. the, the going cliche that water doesn't hydrate. And that's not entirely true, but it does kind of sum up what you're up against. It doesn't automatically hydrate. Just because you drink a ton of water doesn't mean you're going to be sufficiently or, you know, hyper hydrated. Yep, absolutely. All right. We have some live questions. We haven't covered live questions in a while. I'd like to, I like us to get into it more often. Okay. And then we'll uh, close out after this. First live question, any favorite bike races or fondos for roadies or gravel within 90 minutes of Reno? Grindoro. Stetnas. That's the, Stetnas. And what's the other, uh, Pater? not Grindoro. I'm thinking of the other Lost one. Lost and Found. Me. Lost and Found. That's the one. It's pretty um, awesome. Yeah. I'm not actually a huge fan of Grindoro, uh, because I don't like the segment aspect of it, but Lost and Found is a race. That one though, man, uh, mountain bike, uh, that is <laughs> my... Pretty... It can be yeah. pretty rough, <laughs> uh, like a cross country bike, rather than a gravel bike. If unless you're super good, John, you would you like the gravel bike there more? Or would you do the epic? Yeah, I would do a gravel bike on it, especially now. Like if you had something like the the more compliant gravel bikes that exist out there, they're like building in whether it's like specialized with the suspension up front and the stem or anything else. Then I bet it'd be a really a really good bet for that for that course. It depends on the year too, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. that's a yeah. big thing because that's in the mountains with snow and. One year there were like, didn't one of the people in your group mm. get seriously injured because there yeah. just be these huge ruts, uh, huge rain you ruts. had to jump them by going, how fast, tell us that story. How fast yeah. were you going? You had to like jump stuff. We were going over 30 miles an hour in a pace line and we were at the front group at lost and found and it was rolling Hills and it was so, and it was dusty. So we couldn't see, but the spring, it was a heavy winter and the spring had left such huge rain ruts that my friend Nate ended up, uh, yeah, over 30 miles an hour directly into a rain rut and just completely concussed himself. It was pretty scary. So did you jump it? How'd you not hit it? Uh, it was so dusty that I could not see my wheels. I'm serious. Like it was that bad. So looking down, I couldn't see my wheels and we were all being very foolish in my opinion, in retrospect at like thinking that like, yeah, we just got to hold the wheel, right? Like we should have all stepped back and be like, this is sketchy let's all just survive here and let's get through it. Mm -hmm. And we weren't, and we had race brains. And when I saw him riding and I saw his head start to move, cause I wasn't watching his wheel. I, there was no point in watching his wheels. I couldn't see him, but I was watching his head. And when I saw his head move, I instantly knew something was going on and just the body reacted in a split second. And I picked up and hopped cause I knew that there were ruts around there. And I was like, well, I'm either going to hop into the rut or I'm going to hop over the rut. I can't see it. 
and I ended up popping over the rut. So didn't we all ride that? Crazy. I feel we like did. I rode that same we stuff. Did. Yeah, you were there, Nate. Yeah. Yep. Okay. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Then I had a cross bike, which was too steep. Mm. Uh, so I w- going back, I would do the Epic, like probably locked or as tight as possible with uh, gravel tires on it. Yeah. And then that, that slackness, the descending, the dropper post, uh, you hit that rut and just smooths over. I mean, yep. it, actually was the rut, like a mountain bike could have taken it, right? Yeah. Probably would have caused a crash if you had just hit it like Nate, even on a mountain bike, but yeah, oh, really? but it would have been, yeah. it would have been less severe, I bet. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anyways. It's it's an amazing course. Pesquenta is another one. That's the in the Chico stage race. They do that one. That's a great one as well. I'm looking forward to Stetna's. Yeah. <laughs> Stetna's pay dirt. I'm doing that one in two weeks, I think. That one's here in Carson City. It's got two, it's a 65 mile gravel route, but it has two timed segments. And that's going to be that the segments are long. One of them is like kind of like a long dirt road climb, and then it goes into big op- wide open, fast and safe fire road that's like on rolling hills. Then another one is a single track, really smooth, kind of sandy climb uh, that we'll do. So I actually think a hardtail mountain bike might be the fastest one, even though they're recommending like a gravel bike with really fat tires. But I think a hardtail mountain bike might be the fastest bike for that one because you aren't timed in between it. So in between the two stages, it'll be exciting. So if you're going to do that race, let me know. I'd love to see you there. Uh, Okay, Uh, this next one. Uh, I'm trying to read through these live to vet and make sure that you guys don't Bart Simpson me. I'm just going to go for it. Hold on. Uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about increasing carb intake to hundred grams an hour. Has there ever been talk about how to do this? If your only rides are the prescribed workouts, I do my workouts at night. So carb stores are topped off. So adding a carb source like Gatorade to a one hour workout doesn't seem to make sense. Ooh. Yeah. If you're, I mean, so if you're doing the prescribed workouts and you're doing an hour and you have many days between and you're not, you're still able to complete them and you're not, um, the RP might be up a little bit higher than normal, but it's, you don't have to, but if you're doing workouts the next day, um, especially over many days, you can get behind. I, I would, I would do this. And there's a whole thing too, about training your gut. If you're going to race to be able to take in that, if you, if you never do it, and then you have a three hour race and you're like, Oh, now I'm going to take in hundred grams per hour because you probably do need it in that three hour race. That's going to be hard too. You think of it as part of your training and people usually say this because they don't want the calories you can remove that calorie those calories from another part of your day and totally. yeah and then the workout's a little bit easier it's easier to be consistent um you're probably going to recover a little bit better but it's not necessary i would say especially if you have those, those this is approaching this ba- issue from a th- sorry nate this is approaching the issue from a perspective of depri- deprivation rather than nourishment I would encourage you, Tyler, to approach this from a position of nourishment. Feel the work. Make sure it gets done. It's not going to make you fat. <laughs> like, like if you make sure that you're fueling your work adequately on the bike. I know that. I know that it may sound silly when we say it, but we believe that internally. Like, oh, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to put myself in a deficit from the work. Or I've already fueled, therefore I'm going to be able to do it. Just fuel the work. Do it every time. I promise you, sure, you may not need to take in 100 grams an hour. Maybe you take in a little bit less. Maybe you take in a bit more, but always feel the work. It's just a healthy habit to get into, and it's going to help far beyond. If anything else, it's going to give your body more resources to be able to recover with when you're sleeping overnight after doing that workout. And that adds up to being able to get more adaptations later on. Side note, John, we're not going to say who it is or what the result preliminary results are, but we have mm. funded a study to see if uh, that, you know, 90 is actu- actually 90. Uh, different ways to measure it to see how high you can go. Can you go to 140, 120, 160 grams per hour? Um, I think John and I, I don't know if Chad, if you've seen it yet, but John and I have seen some of the results. We'll have the researcher on when they're actually finalized because we can't do it now because they're not finalized. But uh, once the yeah. paper's reviewed and stuff and submitted, that that is very interesting. And I like the idea of us funding studies like that so if there's any researchers out out there and you have something a question that is not answered and you think you can figure out you know do a study to answer that contact us like we could Mm -hmm. i would love to do more of that kind of stuff absolutely it helps us all learn helps us all get faster get better Mm -hmm. so uh okay uh we add one too about the jersey that's in the background behind me and if you're not with us on youtube you should join us thursdays 8 a.m pacific go and do that that's my Cape Epic jersey. And I did frame it myself. I'm proud of that one. So it's got the number in there hard? and everything uh, frame to frame the jersey. Yeah, it was. Yeah, <laughs> did yeah, you yeah. sign it? 
yeah, yeah. Let's, let's keep that <laughs> I sign it <laughs> to Jonathan from Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, Jonathan, <laughs> the tail wins forever. Jonathan. <laughs> That's good. I like that, Chad. No, I did not sign it. No, I'm proud of that one. Did I've got the medal it? in there. No, I didn't even wash it. So um, it's a it's a nasty jersey, and it's gonna stay in there. I wanted it. I didn't want the mud to come off. I didn't Wait, want all sealed. that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's disgusting, Chad. But yeah, yeah, it's my jersey. I'm proud of that one. So, okay. Uh, next, uh, last one is I'm a shift worker, and I'm wondering what are the best methods to keep training more stable. I assume what they mean is consistent with the involved struggles. No. Uh, I meant that it looks like they work days and then at times and they work nights and they're struggling to keep up with eating and sleeping when you go to the night shift and how it gets complicated. And then it all leads to burnout. I'm some, I'm paraphrasing here. So, uh, Nathan, uh, that's, uh, we've covered shift work quite a few times on the podcast and it is something that you, you, there's no way to like circumnavigate it. It is difficult and to be able to adapt to that. And you should expect adaptation periods. If you're a rotating shift work, that's just going to happen. Uh, my recommendation on this case, Nathan is to look at how much you're trying to fit in. And if you're trying to fit in too much and training is becoming discouraging for you, try to look into lower volume training you might be able to get more benefit for doing less. And then the rest of your life won't be so crazy. And then also when we're talking about nourishing yourself, just always plan on making sure that you're taking in carbohydrate when you're on the bike, I've gone into workouts where I'm like, Oh, I wasn't able to eat lunch because I had a busy day. I have my workout. So as I'm getting ready, I start taking in carbohydrate and I take carbohydrate in on the bike. And you know what? My body is able to get through that workout just fine. So if I was just trying to plan on getting through my workouts by the nutrition I took in earlier in the day, that means I have a, a dependency that sometimes is out of my control. I want to remove dependencies and I want to be able to control that. So always plan on fueling yourself when you get on the bike. That's my advice. Anybody else have anything for Nathan? That's a great way is that what you're saying is the recovery might be longer because of all the extra stress. So going to a lower volume and having those extra days between will make it so you could actually recover in you know, have the compensation and then go back and, uh, hit the next workout. Yep. Amazing. Absolutely. Yep. Nailed. Thanks everybody for joining us. If you are listening to this and you haven't got a train road and signed up, don't know what you're waiting for. You're probably been listening to this for a long time. You should go and give it a shot. Try adaptive training. See how fast it makes you for the races that you have coming up. It's fantastic. Use AI FTP detection, go to trainerroadcom slash sign up, or just go there and you can hit the sign up button. Yeah. And I am going to look on Spotify right now. I'm sorry, this is bad podcasting probably, but I want to see how high we are on ratings compared to another one. And I'm going to see if we are up 1.6. Let's see. We need 300 ratings. So everybody listen to this podcast rate. We are getting close every week. We're getting closer, but we need more ratings to be able to be number one rated on Spotify. We're getting close. We're number one on iTunes. We need it here. Five stars. If we don't deserve five stars, let us know. Submit your questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast. And we'll talk to you all next week when we are the number one podcast rated on Spotify. But <laughs> for, for cycling? Yes, <laughs> for bad, cycling. I, I should I should be clear. <laughs> Lots of caveats in this one. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. All right. Chad, thanks, you better everybody. get started to do those hundred beers. <laughs> as soon as we sign off. Yeah. yeah. All right. See y'all. Bye, everybody. Bye.